Good evening, and welcome to the second mini series of the mini summit uh, with the Office of the Tenant Advocate. My name is Johanna Shreve. I am the Chief Tenant Advocate for the agency, and we welcome all tenants in the District of Columbia and others to this very, very important topic this evening. We have a great panel of experts that will talk to you about utilities tonight and the charges that you might be receiving. What a surprise. So we hope all of those of you who have contacted our office during the last 30 days or more, who have complained about receiving charges for utility charges you have no idea about, tonight, hopefully, we will be able to answer some of your questions. Moderator for this program is Joel Cohen, who is the Director of Policy and Legislation for the Office of the Tenant Advocate, and he will introduce the great panel of experts. Joel, take it away. Thank you, Director Shreve, and good evening, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, as Johanna said, I'm Joel Cohn, Legislative Director at the Office of Tenant Advocate. Uh, welcome to this panel discussion entitled Common Utility Building Issues and Crystal uh, I'm hearing a voice. Are you trying to get through to me? Okay. So, so I think if everybody can mute if they're not speaking. Um, so again, the, the panel discussion is entitled Common Utility Billing Issues and Potential Solutions. Uh, first, I'm gonna say a word about the context for this forum. DC renters are increasingly concerned about the utility bills, and that's an understatement. Uh, legal services and other tenant attorneys, council offices, DC agencies, including not only the OTA, but also the Office of the Attorney General and the Office of People's Counsel are experiencing high volumes of utility building complaints from renters in all parts of the district. Recent media reports abound with scenarios, some of which are shocking, including exorbitant jumps in monthly bills at the same time that tenants are experiencing flooding, massive flooding from water pipe leaks in the hallways and the elevators and in their individual units. Com common complaints about utility billing include the lack of relevant lease provisions explaining what charges tenants can expect, lease provisions that are at best cryptic or confusing, unexplained and surprise fees, large lump sum amounts appearing on the bill for the first time, abrupt surges in utility charges for no apparent cause, and third-party vending billing practices. Uh, the goals of this panel discussion are to identify utility billing problems that are the most common and most acute, uh, to review currently applicable laws and regulations and major gaps in the law, to discuss potential new legislative, regulatory, and perhaps programmatic solutions, and then to address your questions and concerns. Uh, the goal is also to inform specifically legislation that OTA is developing in consultation with the Committee on Housing, chaired by Councilmember Robert White, Today, we received word from Councilmember Allen's office that he also is working on relevant legislation. So OTA expects to be working with Councilmember Allen's office as well. To discuss these issues, we are fortunate to have with us uh, a, a talented and expert panel, Nicole McEntee, Program Analyst in OTA's Education and Outreach Branch, Brian Rohal, Senior Staff Attorney at DC Legal Aid, Adam Carlesco, Assistant People's Counsel in the Office of the People's Counsel, Emily Barth, Assistant Attorney General at the Office of the Attorney General, and Joey Trimboli, my colleague uh, in the OTA's policy branch, who is Legislative Counsel. The run of show will be as follows. First, Nicole for OTA and Brian for DC Legal Aid will discuss common concerns among tenants about their utility bills. Then Adam for OPC and Emily for OAG will discuss utility billing compliance from their agency's perspectives, uh, the limits of currently applicable law, and also ideas they have uh, about how we can enhance tenant protections. Finally, Joey for OTA will speak to uh, the currently applicable laws and regulations and gaps in the law and legislative ideas that OTA is working on. Each panelist will have up to 10 minutes for the presentations. Uh, as time permits, within the first 60 minutes, we'll ask the panel to raise any additional points they'd like to make or engage in discussion or Q&A with each other. We'll reserve 30 minutes for um, the audience uh, Q&A period. 
We ask that you please submit the questions in the chat anytime during the first 60 minutes of the presentations. And please let us know which panelists or panelists you'd like to respond to your question. Nicole um, from our education outreach branch will pose the questions in the chat to the panelists during the Q&A. So uh, with that, let's get started. And first I turn it over to you, Nicole. Yes, thank you, Joel. Um, my name is Nicole McEntee, and I am part of OTA's Education and Outreach Division. And um, the primary goal for the Education Outreach Team is to talk to tenants on the ground about um, what they're experiencing and what's going on in their communities. So um, we go out and talk to tenant associations, and through um, these meetings and these discussions we've had, um, we've come to realize the importance of this problem of these utility issues. So I just want to paint the picture for everybody here tonight about what we're hearing and seeing from tenants. Um, so we're increasingly hearing over the past, you know, several months to, to year about utility complaints, um, especially from units that are non-rent controlled. Um, and what happens is when tenants are looking to move in, they ask the leasing agent, you know, what will my utilities cost me? And the leasing agent says, oh, it'll be $60 a month, you know, give or take, right? And so the tenant signs the lease and the lease has what's called a utility addendum um, with some language that might be a little bit confusing to the tenant, but the leasing office sort of says, oh, don't worry about it, right? So the tenant signs, they think they understand this utility addendum, which mentions something about the utilities that the, the tenant needs to be paying. So often the tenant will have to set up their own um, electricity and yet then they find out that they're also being billed for common area electricity for the community, which is a bit confusing to the tenant because they are also paying a separate PEPCO bill. So for the first couple of months when the tenant moves in, you know, the charges seem reasonable. And then suddenly they start to see increases in utility charges. And in some cases, it's double what they've been paying before, just enormous, you know, astronomical utility numbers that they were never expecting. So they go to the leasing office and they say, you know, leasing office, what, you know, why are we being charged these, these fees? And the leasing office says, well, there's complicated math involved with, um, with determining how much exactly your fees should be. And we use this complicated formula and divide the number of occupants in your unit and the square footage of your unit by the number of occupied apartments in the building. And um, just give this sort of outrageous formula for the tenants um, to have to decipher. Um, or worse, they say, sorry, tenant, um, I can't talk to you about that. You have to contact the third party billing company um, who then you know, says, sorry, we don't know. You have to contact your management company. Um, so they really can't get these charges explained in a comprehensive way. They look like they're coming out of nowhere. They're double sometimes the fees that they'd been paying before. Um, and sometimes arbitrary amounts are passed on to tenants uh, because, you know, the, the uh, management company determines that um, certain percentage of common area electricity should be passed on to tenants and the management will pay the rest. Um, so this is this is a common experience that a lot of tenants um, are having. And at renewal, tenants find that they're forced to agree to additional utility charges, sometimes like technology fees that they didn't agree to before. But in order to renew their lease, um, they're required to sign a new utility addendum with with strange new charges. Um, or common area fees or uh, HVAC fees. Um, so they're finding that these fees are just added on um, at their renewal. And then sort of the, the most egregious um, like example that we've found, um, and it's, it's sort of a positive story, is that um, we went out to a, a group of tenants who all have the same management company. So it's four or five buildings with the same management company. And all of these tenants were facing incredibly high utility charges. So the tenants organized together and actually um, had several meetings and decided to create a sort of uh, multi-property tenant association. And that tenant association um, demanded that the management take a look at these utility fees and explain what these charges were. So to their credit, the management company decided to halt those utility charges and put a pause on, on those fees being due. And they investigated. 
and they um, found out uh, that they had mapped the utilities incorrectly when they set up the utilities for these brand new apartments. So it turned out that the way the utility charges were being mapped around these properties, tenants were accidentally paying for um, utility fees for some of the retail spaces because they had shops and, and restaurants under these rest uh, apartments. So um, management found that out and told tenants and refunded those charges. So that is kind of a success story in the sense that tenants were able to organize um, effectively and uh, across several different buildings all in the same sort of area with the same management company. And, um, you know, demanded changes and and management found out that they had uh, made an error and um, corrected it. So, um, you know, if that happened at this one group of buildings, uh, you know, nothing's to say it's not happening elsewhere in the city. Um, so, you know, how many others are experiencing the same issue? So ultimately, tenants are telling us that they feel deceived by these utility fees, but they're also trapped, right? Because um, when they try to renew their lease, they're just forced onto more fees. So their alternative is just simply to move. Um, and there also is no incentive for these tenants to conserve their utility usage, right? If um, they're paying all these common fees and the complicated formula doesn't actually explain what their usage is. So, um, you know, tenants are ultimately asking us, why am I paying these excessive fees? What happens if I don't pay them or can't pay them? What are my recourses here? Um, and that's that's the general sentiment that we've heard from multiple buildings around the city. Um, and that's kind of what we're here to address tonight. Thank you, Joel. I had trouble unmuting. My apologies. Um, Brian, it's all yours. Please take it away. Thank, thanks, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Rohall. I'm a senior staff attorney at uh, Legal Aid DC. I'm going to share some slides because I think it's a little more interesting to look at slides than just stare at my face for the entire time. Hopefully, the slide shows up. Um, I have been asked, I am a housing attorney at uh, DC Legal Aid, um, and and my job tonight is to speak to you about um, utilities issues, but I kind of want to at least start off, I mean, Legal Aid, of course, is, as many of you know, is, is the, the largest uh, civil legal services organization in the city. We do a number of, of different areas of work, um, you know, including you know, public benefits, housing, consumer, but I, I just kind of want to start with a, a, an ex, a, 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 you know, a connection here, right? I'm a housing attorney. I don't regulate you know, utilities. I don't deal with utilities issues directly with like accounting issues. So why am I here? It's because what we are seeing as a problem in the housing, in the eviction defense world, is an increasing number of cases for eviction based on failure of tenants to pay utilities. Um, and I, so I want to start with an explanation of what that problem really means and how it plays out for tenants, and then how it how a failure to pay utilities or a dispute over a utility bill can lead to a loss of housing, um, which is, I, I think, a, a unique um, situation uh, and, and one of the only times that somebody can really be evicted for failure to pay a consumer debt. And I'm going to circle back to that, that theme here in a little bit. But in the eviction um, context, uh, a failure to pay utilities is is filed against a tenant um, as an eviction case, the same way that failing any any lease violation, um, such as you know smoking in your apartment or having a dog in your apartment when you're not allowed to, you have 30 days, you're given a notice to cure that problem. And if you don't cure that problem in those 30 days, the landlord can then proceed to court and potentially obtain what's called a non-redeemable judgment. Meaning that even if you later catch up on all those utility bills, the fact that you did not do it within that 30-day cure period leaves you subject to being evicted. Um, it, this is unlike non-payment of rent. In non-payment of rent, a tenant has the right to catch up in all the rent, redeem their tenancy, save themselves, and stay as long as they catch up any time before the, the marshals show up to perform an eviction. 
Not so with utilities. The law treats these differently in D.C., the same way that it would any other violation of your lease uh, uh, based on behavior or um, or other material lease terms. Um, this becomes very important, um, even though in practice, some judges will take, you know, take pity, right? They will feel sympathetic and choose equitably out of a sense of fairness to only grant that redeemable judgment, to give the tenant a chance to catch up. But the law does not require them to do that. That, that, that really does prey upon the equitable sense of, of what the judge feels in the moment. They're empowered to make that um, that that change. But the tenant is at risk of this from the moment they, they receive that notice. If they don't pay up on those violations uh, or pay up on that on unpaid utility debt within 30 days, um, they are subject to truly losing their housing. And what we're seeing, I mean, what this has done is, is turn eviction court into a debt collection forum uh, in these cases. And that that's quite troubling, as, I, as I'll come back to here in a minute. Um, I want to kind of go through some of the typical issues we, we would raise in a utilities defense case. Obviously, if a person hasn't paid their bills, the, or the argument is not necessarily someone doesn't ever owe a bill or doesn't need to pay their money. But the, the question that comes down to often is that notice that a tenant has been given, told you have 30 days to fix this problem, 30 days to pay up your debt. Is that the correct cure that we should be putting before a tenant? And, and to give you some context, what the type of notices I've seen just coming across my plate the last week or two, you owe $4,200 in unpaid utilities. Um, you must pay within 30 days. Uh, and by the way, if, the, if you're a voucher holder and you owe zero rent because you have no income, no affordability, no, no variation here, $4,200 within 30 days, or that's it, proceed to eviction. Um, our argument we have been putting forward to the court uh, in these cases is that that is not the correct legal cure that landlords should be putting forward to tenants. If a tenant has failed to pay utilities in the past, then they, if they have violated their lease for failing to pay those past utilities, then the cure in 30 days or in the next, whatever the next monthly billing cycle is, is to pay that next month's bill. Not It should not be to pay up $4,200 because the landlord sat back and waited sometimes for a year, two years for that billing to accumulate, maybe out of kindness, maybe not. I don't know why they're waiting. But if they put this forward on a tenant and give them 30 days, the cure should be something that's attainable to the tenant. If their violation has been not paying the monthly bill, then the next month they pay the bill and they've come back into compliance with the obligations they've committed to as a tenant. The landlord could then, of course, go after them through you know, for that other that past due balance through some other debt collection action where there are significant procedures and protections for tenants already, but not proceed on this back balance that's accrued. So that's one major issue that we're seeing. We're trying to raise. It is not a settled issue of law. And as we may come to in discussion, I, I would ask that, that that might be something we consider as a legislative or regulatory change to be made. Another issue that comes up when we think about these um, large balances that tenants are seeing in these th in given 30 days simply to come current on this large balance owed, this, is that there is a regulation that requires very clearly that any time a tenant is told that they have violated their lease and must cure it, that alleged violation must have occurred in the six months before the notice is delivered to them. But in some of these cases where people are seeing utilities of bills of four thousand dollars come up, you know, sometimes they didn't they weren't even receiving those monthly bills and suddenly it sprung on them all at once. We're finding that those bills are a year or more old. You know, there's, there's a significant amount of time that's gone on. And arguably, that is not uh, more than arguably. I believe this is very clear. And we've had judges rule in this favor that collecting springing old debt on a tenant and suddenly requiring them to pay up in 30 days violates that regulatory framework that says six months is the is the maximum. And then finally, th this issue that I, I raised just a minute ago, the, the issue about redeemable judgments, it, it, that preys right now upon the, the judge to give the tenant the right to cure and, and catch up if there more than 30 days have gone by. Um, that should not be what the law is. It should be required that the old, similar in non-payment of rent, that if this is a money issue, that the tenant should be provided the same opportunity to cure as if it were rent. I mean, to, to these landlords that are collecting this money, 
it's a single ledger they're keeping. Money is fungible, right? If, if money comes into the landlord, the landlord, you know, is some, at times distributing in their own sense, they're, they're claiming the right at times to say, this goes to that bill, this goes to that. If the tenant has the right to pay up the rent late, the tenant should additionally have the right to pay up the utilities late. Um, so those are some of the defenses we're seeing. And then to this issue of, of uh, I've mentioned several times, the separate debt collection practice, there are a number of consumer protections that are out there in situations where a tenant, or where any citizen of DC has a, uh, a a debt that's coming after a credit card debt, uh, you know, any other sort of consumer debt that someone has, there are a series of debt collection protections that were passed just recently um, and codified there in the in the statutory provision I have on the on the screen, um, which include a lot of notice provisions, a lot of limitations on the way in which a person can be contacted and a way in which a a, a, some, a creditor can can um, communicate about debt collections. Uh, that when someone comes through landlord tenant court, those protections, in some ways, don't seem to you know, as transparently apply. Uh, we are we have recently had a decision from the court um, that is starting to connect those protections over in non-payment of rent cases. And I believe it is by on that same principle that this this debt collection law should apply to the notices um, that are sent to tenants when they are told that their utility bills have not been paid up in, in full. But those notices, those disclosures have not been appearing on those notices. Um, and, and this is, this is um, again, seems to be a circumvention getting around this protection that was created to, you know, to protect consumers who have debt uh, and in 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 allow the, what we're seeing is landlords that seem to be almost executing or acting on this special privilege they seem to have that because the debt is connected to the lease that they they don't seem to feel like they are um, subject to those same protections. I do believe they are, and I think that we're going to see that in some cases they may be held more accountable um, as as we as we see these things litigated more often. But I think that a more transparent approach through policy through legislation through regulation showing that connection and the the expectation that any debt collection practice is still even through landlord tenant court should still be um, uh, subject to those same protections and similarly there are protections under the consumer Prote uh, protection procedures act sometimes called the cppa uh, that also here uh, come up with possibly with with bad billing practices uh, that where landlords could be subject to um, uh, to liability under those protections as well um, and then there are some other issues that come up that tenants are limited by uh, with this non-redeemable judgment at stake, being given 30 days to catch up on the entire balance. There's a question out here. How do tenants challenge the billing that they're being provided if they don't have a direct relationship with these billing companies all the time? If someone's receiving a bill um, for HVAC services, right, and, and, and they're also paying the Pepco bill, and they think that they're being double billed but they don't have a direct relationship with this landlord's uh, billing company, how can they challenge that? They could simply not pay the same way you might not pay your rent. But then, as we said, the law currently doesn't allow for a redeemable judgment. They're subjecting themselves if they're wrong and they actually owe that money. They might be found to be liable and then be evicted solely because they had an honest dispute about the billing. And this is something where tenants are quite vulnerable and often feel threatened and they feel they simply have no choice but to pay. And similarly, the utility assistance programs that are out there are that the city provides quite, I mean, quite helpful programs, great benefits to, to tenants who have utility bills in their own name. Many of those programs are not available to tenants where the utilities are in the landlord's name or in this third party billing company's name. And, and sometimes the utility assistance that might even be provided is not provided in a way that directly applies to those specific tenants and goes to the, the benefit of the building but doesn't actually go to the tenant themselves that needs it. So these limitations create some, some real barriers for tenants um, seeking that assistance. Um, so, so that's kind of my, my rundown of what we're seeing in housing court. Um, I do want to just kind of, while, while I have the mic, I want to kind of put up here on the screen, um, the, any tenants who are watching who do have these issues coming up and want to speak directly with a lawyer who um, can speak to their own interests, their rights, um, I have here on the left side of the screen our Landlord Tenant Legal Assistance Network. Um, that phone number, 780-2575, is available, live answered, um, and connects folks with lawyers. We also legal aid has some walk-in information, so that's on the screen as well. Um, and I will at this point turn it back over to Joel. 
Great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and we're going to move to Adam uh, from OPC. Good evening, everyone. Let me share my screen with you as well. I have some slides prepared for the evening. Uh, my name is Adam Carlesco. I'm Assistant People's Counsel with the Office of the People's Counsel. Uh, OPC is the statutorily designated advocate for all DC ratepayers uh, for utilities. Uh, and in doing so, we represent ratepayer interests uh, through not just a direct representation in disputes, but also through ensuring fair rates uh, at the Public Service Commission uh, and uh, providing a level of oversight uh, for water, which does not fall under the Public Service Commission. So we handle everything gas, electric, water, and landline telecommunications. And I think uh, kind of the crux of where we come in as it relates to tenant issues, what was hinted at by Brian a little bit, uh, in that we largely at OPC represent uh, and are able to help uh, homeowners and those who have a direct, what we call privity of contract with the utility. Um, in this instance, that's, that's a direct legal relationship between the customer and the service provider, such as Pepco or DC Water. And um, however, that does not include tenants in multifamily buildings that are served by third-party billers. And so this makes for a significant problem because uh, tenants do not have a direct contract with utility providers. Uh, we have had a number of people who have had uh, significant issues or bill disputes uh, that they would like to raise uh, in multifamily buildings and we are unable to help them. Um, while in DC Water, if you are a tenant in a single family residence, you may have the ability to become a customer of record and pay bills and receive bills. Um, you know, that is largely for an individually metered single family unit. Um, this does not work uh, in the instance of a, a large building that is employing third party billers by the landlord. And so a number of these uh, companies uh, operate throughout the district uh, and they exist in something of a regulatory gray space. Uh, they do not fall under the Public Service Commission because they provide more of a, a financial service to landlords than an actual provider, uh, you know, a, a utility provider sort of situation. And so oftentimes uh, tenants don't really have that appeal right. Uh, and these billers you can't go, you can't go to the Public Service Commission to dispute this. Uh, and OPC oftentimes cannot help in those instances. And so one of the big things that we've noticed is that uh, almost all of these instances fall for uh, multifamily buildings. And um, in DC, the Public Service Commission has made it illegal for submetering within large multifamily buildings. Uh, the, the idea behind that is largely uh, they do not want uh, third parties essentially selling electricity beyond uh, the meter run by the utility. And in the instance of having individual submeters in a large apartment complex, uh, this opens up the opportunity for uh, landlords to essentially become their own service providers uh, in, in a sense by you know, passing electricity from the master meter for the building into uh, individual submeters and then setting their own prices accordingly. And so I think one thing to make clear with this is that there's a distinction uh, between an individual meter, which is established by the utility and set up outside of your residence. Uh, some people may notice that if you live in a row home or single family home and you receive gas, you'll have a meter sticking along the side, you know, a large metal box, you can see it tick off every single hour. Um, but for individual residences, many of the, in, in, for multifamily buildings, many of them in the district do not have any sort of sub metering, uh, one, because it's illegal for gas and electric, but two, uh, because DC Water does not fall under the Public Service Commission, and they are kind of a self-regulated, uh, semi-governmental entity, uh, the submetering for them is permitted. However, it is rare, uh, given some of the technical difficulties, uh, especially in many of the older buildings uh, where they did not originally install any sort of submetering for individual units. And so because of this, um, Oftentimes, we have no relationship between the tenant and the utility. And so OPC cannot really help in those situations. Some of the issues that we do see uh, with sub metering, though, is that uh, oftentimes they are not necessarily accurate. Uh, whereas DC water can go out to your uh, house 
and go to the meter in the street and pull out the meter, bring it to their shop and test it. Oftentimes these submeters are installed for the construction of a building uh, and they are not necessarily as accurate or as regularly replaced uh, as something that a utility would provide. Uh, another thing that we've noticed is that uh, there isn't necessarily a, a level of transparency in a lot of these multifamily buildings, I believe. Uh, Brian touched on this a little bit because uh, these figures are largely calculated by third-party billers. And many times these are proprietary sort of formulas uh, that they're using to calculate uh, your particular unit and um, attendants don't really have too much of a right to get those calculations sorted out for them. Um, another thing that we've noticed as well is that uh, sometimes there is a risk of overcharge um, for uh, tenants in multifamily buildings uh, because third party billers don't really have any sort of statutory or regulatory restrictions on some of the charges and markups that they can employ. And so this leads to kind of a a wild west, if you will, uh, for these third party builders. And um, also, there is no direct path to appeal. Uh, with DC Water, if you have an issue with your water bill and you own your home, uh, you can dispute your monthly bill directly uh, with a letter to DC Water. If you are unsatisfied with their investigation, you can take that up to an administrative appeal uh, to a hearing officer in DC Water. If that's not to your liking, you can go all the way up to the DC uh, uh, DC Court of Appeals, the uh, Supreme Court of DC, if you will. Uh, but for tenants, they don't have that privy of contract. They can't take that same appeal process. And as Brian mentioned, oftentimes they're left uh, with large bills that they can't dispute, even if it is a an actual meaningful dispute that they have with their utility provider. And so um, I think some of the issues that we have Two are disconnections. Um, there are a level of protections for disconnections uh, within the district for tenants um, because tenants are not billed necessarily directly by utility companies, uh, oftentimes going through third party billers. Um, that largely falls to the landlord in terms of um, ensuring that the entire facility is not disconnected. However, when it comes to individual uh, properties that are individually metered, such as a, a rented home, a rented single family house, uh, the similar protections exist from disconnection as you would for a homeowner. And oftentimes with the consent of the landlord, uh, renters within that situation are able to become listed as third parties on bills. They can receive bills, they can pay bills, uh, they can dispute bills and are treated not dissimilar from many of the customers uh, who you know own their homes outright. And um, however, these, as I mentioned, these protections don't necessarily apply to those who are customers of third-party billers and large residents. Uh, so it's important to kind of ask if you are uh, either uh, renting a single family home or in a larger building for clarification on, uh, from your utility and your third-party biller as to uh, what these rates are, what their figures are, how they've calculated your things uh, to ensure that you're not being overcharged especially in the instance of a third party biller. Um, and so one of the big things that uh, OPC is at least hoping for uh, with this forum and, and future discussions is to try and get similar protections uh, for renters as there are for homeowners. And so what we're looking at in terms of the current regulatory landscape for utility billing is that uh, the Public Service Commission uh, does not extend to these third party billers. And so we've noticed a number of gaps uh, they, these billers do not have to apply uh, to the same rules that utilities have to uh, when it comes to uh, consumer protections. Uh, they don't necessarily have an appeal process for individual customers. And uh, oftentimes they don't really have the same, I guess, clarity requirements that the other utilities do, uh, either DC Water or those that are regulated by the Public Service Commission. And so OPC is identifying a number of gaps uh, that uh, we could really use some stronger rules and, and laws within the district to protect uh, customers of third-party billers. And so it's important for tenants to, uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier in the discussion, uh, try and organize associations amongst buildings, uh, speak to council members, uh, and uh, try and move towards a, a greater regulation and transparency of this uh, relative uh, regulatory gray space. And so some of the recommendations that OPC has uh, based upon our kind of uh, what we've seen within our outreach uh, with, I guess, our outreach and intake of consumer complaints, because anytime that there's utility complaints, 
oftentimes we're the we're the first line for people to come to. And uh, many times, unfortunately, we have to turn away third party billers uh, or, or customers of third party billers because we lack that uh, authority to represent them the same way that we do for homeowners. And so some of the things that we've noticed that, that could be worth uh, implementing within statute or regulations uh, is requiring itemized bills from third party billers. Currently, there doesn't seem to be very clear regulation or laws on the books that dictate them to describe what their uh, usage details are, any sort of fees that are listed, um, or any process for dis disputes. Uh, those are largely absent on a lot of bills. Um, another aspect is to limit fees. Uh, currently, third-party billers can apply a variety of different fees uh, to bills, and it can be masked. And so I think providing uh, a limit on those is of the utmost importance. Uh, providing uh, cost transparency that requires landlords and billers to fully explain uh, how they're making these calculations uh, within their bills, within uh, the uh, rental agreements, I think would be a, a large step in the right direction uh, to make a more equitable landscape for tenants. Uh, I think an, another one that we've noticed and, and uh, had some complaints about as well is uh, public housing. So a number, this was mentioned before, a number of people who are recipients of vouchers uh, they often don't necessarily have a full understanding or is not necessarily made clear to them uh, either, you know, by some communication error or because of a, a lack of translation into a native language, since DC is such a cosmopolitan place, uh, that they are sometimes unaware that they are responsible for utilities of the property uh, that they are renting because their voucher covers uh, housing and there is not necessarily clarity in what they're responsible for. Uh, I think another one, and this I think goes more to a, the Public Service Commission and, and uh, I guess to DC Water as well, is uh, for tenants to uh, be able to use sub metering within larger buildings and allow single family homes to receive and pay utility bills. Um, oftentimes at, at, at this current moment, uh, you require the consent of the landlord to be listed as a third party recipient of bills. And we think that should be expanded to a certain extent. Uh, we have an instance case, uh, we spoke with a tenant this uh, this afternoon who actually had a $4,000 bill and they are currently in dispute and lawsuits and they have restraining orders with their landlord uh, and their landlord has allowed their water to be shut off. And it has been a whole rigmarole trying to address this issue uh, because they are, despite being in a single family home, unable to receive their bill, unable to get set up on a payment plan the same way that a home would. Um, and I think lastly, there is no complaint process that's in place uh, for uh, third party bill or recipients. You, as I mentioned before, with DC Water, have a very clear uh, statutory and regulatory uh, outlined path to appeal any sort of bill disputes. Uh, and there are multiple layers that you can go through. There's nothing along those lines for third party bill or recipients. And uh, that leaves tenants who are already likely the more vulnerable of the lot within the district, uh, much more vulnerable than, than homeowners uh, when it comes to utility issues. And so, um, you know, OPC is here to help. We may not be able to assist uh, if you are a uh, resident of a third party, in a, in a large multifamily building and are receiving your bills from third party billers. Uh, however, we also serve as a liaison to other governmental agencies. And so we're here to answer questions for you, advocate for you. And um, if you need assistance, uh, my name is Adam Carlesco. You can reach out to me. I have the email for OPC up. Uh, if you go to opc-dc.gov, you can come to our website and uh, we'll be able to answer any questions that you might have there. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Joel. Thank you so much, Adam. And we'll, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Emily Barth from OAG. Great. Thanks, Joel. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Emily Barth. I'm an assistant attorney general at OAG's Office of Consumer Protection. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about OAG's um, mediation program, which is how we address many of the utility complaints that we receive from tenants in the district, um, and also kind of talk about what we're doing. But let me pull up some slides. Okay, so 
OAJ's mediation program is part of the office's public advocacy division, which focuses on civil affirmative work. And this includes more than just consumer protection, it's antitrust and nonprofit, civil rights and elder justice, housing and environmental justice, workers' rights and anti-fraud, and consumer protection. Um, OAG has several consumer protection tools, um, including litigation. Uh, we enforce the Consumer Protection Procedures Act, which you've heard talked about tonight, the CPPA. Uh, we do consumer education, legislative advocacy, and also consumer tenant mediation, which is what I'd like to focus on a little bit. So what does OAG mediation do? It is unlike court-ordered mediation. Um, our goal is to try to resolve consumer and tenant complaints without the need to go to court. And for our purposes, um, under the CPPA, a consumer or a tenant is also a consumer. So I'm going to use consumer and tenant here interchangeably. It is a free service. Uh, we can try to help when the consumer or tenant is a DC resident or the business is located or headquartered in the district. Um, this is not a legal service. We would direct you to Legal Aid or the Landlord Tenant Legal Advocacy Network, uh, some of the resources that were shared earlier. Um, so we don't provide legal advice. We don't provide individual representation or comment on whether we can submit a complaint is good or bad. And it's voluntary. Um, like traditional mediation, both sides, the consumer and the business, must choose to engage. So we can't force or compel an outcome. The, the, um, so some of the common complaints that we receive are issues of billing disputes, landlord tenant issues, including building conditions issues, security of deposit returns, lease breaks, ratio utility billing systems or rubs, utility complaints, contract disputes, social media lockout, um, and other kind of scam and credit repair issues. There must be a consumer merchant transaction, um, which includes um, landlord tenant issues, as I mentioned earlier. We also focus on priority issues, which include utility issues. Um, and those include uh, when we hear from tenants um, who live in the district that their utility has been shut off and it is the landlord's responsibility to pay for that utility or there is an impending risk of a utility shutoff that is the landlord's responsibility and not the tenant's. And we prioritize those issues um, for all of the basic utilities, including non-working air conditioning or heat, um, when it's the landlord's responsibility by hopefully receiving those calls through our consumer hotline and reaching out to the responsible party the same day. We also prioritize financial stands and projects. There are some things we can't help with. We operate under the umbrella, the very broad umbrella of the Consumer Protection Procedures Act, must meet the jurisdictional requirements that I mentioned below. The person has to be a DC resident or um, the business must be located or headquartered in the district. Um, there has to be a consumer merchant transaction, which means we can't assist with business to business issues, um, even if it's a small business owner. Um, we're happy to help and get involved if you have representation, but we do need your lawyer's express permission to help you. And again, we don't do, um, we can't give legal advice. So OAG does have the authority to enforce the DC Consumer Protection Procedures Act. And the DC um, CPPA is a wonderful statute. Um, but it is a broad remedial statute, um, and it is designed to protect consumers from unfair, deceptive acts and practices. Um, and it does include landlord tenant transactions, and it does apply um, for, like, in most scenarios, in the RUBS or ratio utility billing services um, context. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit um, later on about. Um, because the CPPA is so broad, it might not protect tenants in the way that provides immediate protection or protection before the time of leasing. So 
The CPPA, again, very broad. It provides a non-exhaustive list of prohibited trade practices, uh, but the very broad categories include deceptive conduct, unfair conduct, and unlawful conduct. So, ratio utility billing systems, um, we have seen an increase in the complaints that we receive about rubs. Um, as Adam said before, these um, are generally, um, it's a method that owners of multi-unit buildings, uh, multi-unit housing complexes use to distribute the cost of utilities between tenants when there are no submeters. This is not submetering. Um, and they're typically working with a third-party utility billing service, some of the common ones um, that are present in the district, um, Con Service, Yes, Metergy, Studebaker, there are many others. What RUBS does is it divides up the bill from the master utility meter to all of the tenants of the building um, based on some sort of algorithm or calculation. And generally, that's based on the square footage of the individual unit um, the number of tenants that occupy the unit, or some combination of both. And it is becoming an increasingly common solution um, when older buildings do not have submeters for utilities, or new construction is built without um, submeters or direct meters and tenant units to save costs. Um, but as we've seen from the complaints that we've received, and as Nicole alluded to earlier, issues have arisen with a lack of transparency in the billing and allocation process. And more recently, we've seen issues um, with common area utility billing. So generally, the use of RUBS is typically disclosed in the lease or the utility addendum, but lease and kind of pre-lease disclosures at the time of tenant application vary widely in how specific they are and what is disclosed to the tenant. Other fees associated with RUBS like admin, administrative fees, service fees, other fees that could be labeled any main that are usually low dollar fees um, are also typically made in the lease or utility than them to lease. Um, and tenants who are under a RUBS billing system usually receive a bill from a third party utility billing service, but generally they pay their utilities directly to the landlord or the property manager through their resident portal or however they pay their monthly bills. Some of the common um, tenant concerns that we've heard with RUBS, which are completely non-exhaustive, is that the lease and pre-lease disclosures are not clear and specific. Um, folks who have never rented in a building that uses a ratio utility billing system may have no idea what um, utilities are billed by a third party service provider need. Um, the billing process itself, as far as what um, methodology is used, is not transparent. And this means that tenants can't um, meaningfully budget for month to month, especially with the assessment of common area utilities, because RUBS can also be for utilities in your individual unit and increasingly in the common area of these multi-unit buildings as well. And this creates a lack of trust about the billing process. So one way that we have seen um, other jurisdictions, including our neighboring jurisdiction, Maryland, address RUBS concerns is by passing legislation concerning RUBS and what specific disclosures must be made about RUBS to tenants at the time of the tenant application. Maryland in June of 2022 enacted RUBS legislation and Minnesota also recently enacted uh, legislation surrounding RUBS and submetering that's set to go in effect uh, in January of 2025. Both of these passed with bipartisan support and no opposition, and even had the support of each respective state's multi-housing association, um, which represents landlords and businesses, business owners. Um, because, um, you know, it's important that tenants, I think on the back end, some of the things that we've seen with some of the complaints is tenants who enter into the um, leases with RUBS have found that they can't afford the monthly rent, can't afford to pay utilities, and having clear disclosures up front um, is both um, good for the tenants, but also, I'd imagine, um, saves time for the landlord and property managers as well. They want to stay rented, um, rent out their units, they don't want to be um, Maryland's law is, I think, 
kind of instructive to one way DC may address um, bringing more specific tenant disclosures and protection in the realms of situation. And so Maryland's law requires landlords to provide disclosures to protect the tenants in writing. This is a non-exhaustive list, um, but it requires a copy of the last utility bills issued to the landlord, a description of the method that will be used, average monthly bill um, for all the dwelling units and the residential um, property in the previous calendar year by utility. Um, the tenant right to inspect utility records retained by the landlord, uh, that any information regarding the fees and charges are provided to the tenant up front, and also to provide a citation to the specific law. Um, it also includes a provision that the landlord's failure to disclose any of these provisions to the tenant makes um, their ability to collect under rubs unenforceable which is like a good, a very, very compelling um, way to get landlords to comply with this law. So we don't have these specific protections in DC right now. Um, so what can tenants do now? If you are a prospective tenant, um, reading your lease very carefully before signing it and being on the lookout for these sorts of disclosures making sure you understand what exactly you're responsible for when it comes to your utilities and how they will be built. It's very important. I think um, if a prospective tenant could take the list of requirements from the Maryland statute and request those of the prospective landlord um, to ask to see the past um, utility bill so that they could have a sense of what their bill is to make sure that this is the property for them. Um, it's also important, I think, what we've learned from some of the recent complaints is to understand the definitions. For example, um, you know, we've seen disclosures that say tenants could be responsible for common area uh, utility billing. Understanding what's included in the common area is also very important and having clear definitions of asking for those in advance if they're not in your lease. Uh, if you're doing a new lease up or recertifying um, or renewing your lease, um, kind of reviewing your lease, making those requests um, at that moment. We also really encourage people to reach out to their council member, to their AMC and to OTA to talk about um, kind of what they're experiencing and what policy changes would work for them. Sometimes, though, what we also see is that there are um, there is incorrect billing with rubs because of technical and maintenance issues. Um, for example, the monitoring equipment is malfunctioning. So another thing, if you are currently in a building that uses rubs and you think that your bills are too high or they're growing at a percentage rate that um, doesn't make sense to you, is to, you're welcome to submit a consumer complaint to OAG through our online portal, but it's to reach out to the maintenance at your building and to ask that these, this monitoring equipment is inspected to make sure it's calculating the usage rate properly. The other thing is to um, verify that the algorithm that's being used for your building billing is correct for your unit. For example, that the algorithm that's being applied to you lists the correct number of tenants in your unit and it lists your correct uh, unit size. We've seen mistakes happen, um, especially um, human error, like inputting the wrong number of tenants per unit, inputting the wrong unit size that distorts what the bill should actually be, and then money is refunded to the tenant. We've also seen some technicalities when there's a recent change for property management at properties that use clubs for their billing. Um, Generally, any sort of retail customer is excluded from the residential rent calculation and allocation to tenants. And we've seen some instances where it's reported that their bills have spiked very high. We've reached out to the property management system, and it was an error where um, at the time they took over the building, they didn't um, remove the uh, retail space from the building. 
um, and we're calculating the building that we're holding, which included both retail and residential. For some variables. So please um, contact OAG Mediation if you're having an issue um, that is um, a consumer tenant dispute um, that we can try to resolve without the need to go to court. Uh, there's a QR code that takes you to our flyer. Um, we also welcome your calls to our hotline. We try to reach them the same business day. Um, you can submit a complaint online, which is the best and most efficient way to get connected with a mediator, or email us at consumer.protection at dc.gov. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Emily. Thanks very much. And we're going to turn to Joey uh, to talk about OTA policy stuff. All right, thank you, Joel, uh, and welcome again, everybody. Thanks for being here. <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen to get my presentation going. Okay, so good evening, everyone. My name is Joey Tromboli. I'm a legislative counsel with the Office of the Tenant Advocate. Uh, tonight, I'll be going over some of the district's current laws pertaining to utility billing, uh, some best practices from other jurisdictions, and a few ideas that OTA is considering for potential legislative proposals down the road to ensure that tenants have the benefit of reasonable expectations uh, for utility bills charged by their landlords. Uh, and at the end, I'll also briefly discuss a piece of legislation that is currently before the DC Council uh, having to do with disconnection of water service due to non-payment on water bills. So to get started on current utility billing laws in the district, um, so with respect to uh, a tenant's ability to uh, pay a utility bill and to get on the utility account where a landlord has failed to pay the bill, uh, and thus the tenant wants to prevent the disconnection of that utility. Um, on water, whoops, let me just minimize this here so I can see my slide. Okay, so <clears throat> with respect to water, uh, where a landlord fails to pay a water bill that is in the landlord's name, DC Water may place the account in the tenant's name if it is deemed practicable by the mayor slash DC Water. Uh, and then in terms of electricity and gas, uh, similarly, but uh, fra framed a little bit differently, the utility provider may not shut off service for the landlord's failure to pay the bill without first notifying the tenant of the opportunity to have the service placed in the tenant's name, again, where practicable. Uh, and in this case, amounts paid by the tenant per such an arrangement may be deducted from the rent um, so these provisions could theoretically help a tenant to avoid disconnection of these utilities for non-payment where the landlord, you know, was the one responsible for paying the bill and failed to do so. Uh, however, at least in the case of water, I would note this is not an ideal solution for at least a couple of reasons. Uh, first, um, of course, the tenant would then need to pay the water bill themselves once they have been placed on the account. Uh, and the landlord is not necessarily going to have decreased the rent uh, accordingly, right? If the tenant's utility costs were otherwise included in the rent or the water costs rather. Uh, and second, my understanding is that uh, it is rarely deemed practical uh, as per the statutory language quoted here uh, for DC Water to place the bill in the tenant's name. Uh, and of course, in the case of both of these provisions, we have that where practicable or deemed practicable language, which gives the utility provider the wiggle room uh, such that the tenant should not necessarily rely on being able to take over the utility account uh, if they're in danger of a disconnection due to the landlord's failure to pay. Um, and regarding the water piece, I'll just note that this issue would be largely addressed by legislation currently before the council that I will highlight at the end of my presentation. So next, uh, as Adam discussed, uh, a landlord may not install its own private submeters to measure usage of electricity or gas in order to build a tenant accordingly. Uh, and this means the actual usage measurements are going to be done by the utility provider itself with one or more meters, uh, whether that's a master meter for the building or uh, individual meters for each unit. Uh, and accordingly, as I note here, uh, the landlord still may have units that are individually metered by the utility provider um, and in that case, the meters are installed and monitored by the utility provider, and the tenant um, would have a direct contractual relationship with that provider. So this provision, this next provision, uh, is from the tenant screening law. Um, it may have some applicability to uh, utility billing concerns. Um, so 
before requesting any information or fees from a prospective tenant as part of tenant screening, uh, in other words, during the application process, a uh, housing provider first has to notify the prospective tenant of, uh, among other things, the amount and purpose of each fee or deposit, whether mandatory or voluntary, that may be charged to a tenant. Uh, and this is likely of questionable benefit to the tenant per utility bills. Uh, the use of the words fee and deposit uh, may not apply to monthly utility charges that are likely to vary according to usage of the utility and also according to the landlord's method of allocating those costs to the tenants. Uh, in any event, I would say I believe this provision could reasonably be read to require a landlord to inform a prospective tenant about additional fees associated with utility billing, like administrative fees that might be charged by a third party billing company uh, that the tenant's going to see on a monthly basis. Um, so uh, this law is relatively new, and I'm not sure if those kinds of fees are in practice actually being disclosed uh, as a result of this provision here. Um, and just one more uh, note. Um, well, first I'll do this slide actually before I do the one more note. So uh, in the rent control scenario, uh, where the landlord uh, newly wishes to switch from including utilities in the tenant's rent to instead uh, doing any of the following, individually metering the utilities, sub-metering, which again can only lawfully be done in the case of water uh, and is rarely done, uh, or using a rubs formula as Emily described for uh, utility billing, um, so in, in the rent control situation to accomplish this, the landlord first has to file a services and facilities petition for approval by the rental accommodations division or RAD at DHCD. Uh, RAD may reduce the amount of rent to proportionally reflect the shift of utility costs from inclusion in the rent on the one hand to instead a separate and likely varying monthly bill that the tenant is newly going to have to pay according to one of those above methods. Um, tenants, uh, importantly, would have the opportunity to contest the landlord's proposal uh, and provide input as to what the appropriate reduction of rent amount would be, among other things. Um, and I'll just add that it's important that tenants be able to have a voice in that petition process. Uh, for example, in a past services and facilities petition we're aware of where the tenant, uh, excuse me, where the landlord is going to switch from utilities included in rent to tenants paying utilities separately, uh, the landlord proposed only a $2 decrease in the rent to go along with the tenants newly paying the bills separately. So in other words, tenants would have been responsible for paying utility bills out of their own pocket, and this would have been matched or not matched at all, as you may prefer, by only a $2 decrease in the rent, uh, likely much less than the tenants' uh, newly separate utility costs that they're going to be paying. Uh, and now I'll just note one more a note on utilities, uh, and this is a uh, this is something that's highlighted in our tenant bill of rights. So we thought it was worth mentioning that uh, a landlord may not use self-help eviction methods, such as, for example, cutting off utilities to force a tenant out. Uh, the landlord has to go through the judicial process. So I just thought that was worth mentioning. So now I'm going to highlight some best practices uh, as far as statutory protections for tenants in regard to utility billing uh, in other jurisdictions. So first, uh, Maryland, this is kind of a recap of uh, some things Emily already highlighted. Um, in the case of RUBS, that ratio utility billing system, where the landlord is using RUBS for a utility, they have to disclose uh, or provide to any prospective tenant copy of the landlord's most recent two utility bills for the property, description of the method that will be used to allocate the cost of the utility to the tenant, uh, the average monthly bill for all units in the residential, uh, in the rental property in the last year, and information regarding any additional charges or fees to be paid by the tenant for the operation of the RUBS billing system. Uh, and Emily highlighted this as well. Uh, this is you know, definitely a, a key piece of this. RUBS is unenforceable. A RUBS bill is unenforceable if the landlord has not provided the above disclosures. Uh, and uh, during the tenancy, uh, a landlord uh, in Maryland who's using RUBS must allow a tenant to inspect the landlord's utility bills for the property. Okay. Moving on, next, Virginia, a uh, couple of interesting provisions in Virginia. Uh, late fees on utility payments are limited to $5 max, and uh, the landlord is required to maintain uh, adequate records regarding energy submetering equipment, energy allocation equipment, uh, water and sewer submetering, or a ratio utility billing system, or RUBS. 
uh, and the landlord must permit tenants to inspect or copy those records. Um, and I believe the landlord can charge the tenant reasonable costs uh, of making copies. And then in Oregon, uh, utility charges and common area charges must be described separately in the lease. So that way the tenant is able to understand how much of my utility bill is coming from the common areas versus my own utility or my own unit. Um, and uh, this one I think is, is really important. Uh, the landlord may only charge the tenant for utilities according to actual costs incurred by the landlord. And I think this goes with the principle that the landlord should not be profiting uh, on its method of uh, charging tenants for utilities. Uh, and next, uh, I'll just describe some general ideas that the OTA is considering for uh, possible legislative proposals down the line to provide transparency and predictability in landlord utility billing. Uh, these are some initial concepts largely borrowed from other jurisdictions, uh, particularly the Maryland, Maryland law that I sampled a few slides ago and that Emily discussed. Uh, these are focused on addressing uh, especially certain intake scenarios we've encountered at OTA where tenants have received utility billing, uh, utility charges and fees from the landlord that went well beyond what they had reasonably expected when they began uh, renting the unit, given the info uh, that they had. So uh, again, like in Maryland, um, you know, it, it, it might be uh, useful or prudent to require the landlord to uh, give a prospective tenant, you know, the time they're applying for the unit the average utility bill for one or more units uh, in the property over some pe prior period of time. You know, uh, tenants may go in with some idea based on their experience of, uh, you know, given that they're, say, they're, it's, it's the tenant and their partner that who are going to, you know, two tenants going to occupy the unit. Um, the unit is X amount of square feet, and they have some idea of how much water or electricity they usually use and how much that will cost. But, um, you know, looking at the actual utility bills uh, that have um, that have come from that property uh, could alert the tenants to, you know, maybe the uh, the appliances or systems in that building are not energy efficient, or maybe the landlord has not replaced ancient refrigerators that are highly energy in inefficient. And by being able to look at those past utility bills, tenants can get an idea of if the utility billing in this property is going to be perhaps far beyond what we would normally expect um, with uh, X number of tenants in a unit of X size. Um, and again, a copy of one or more of the landlord's recent utility bills for the property and going with that information on the method the landlord will use to allocate the cost to the tenant, especially the rubs formula itself that will be used to calculate the utility bill if rubs is going to be used. Um, so the idea with two and three there is that the tenant can take the landlord's, you know, master utility bill for the building, um, square footage of the unit that they're expecting to rent, how many tenants uh, are going to be in the unit, plug that information into the rubs formula and get an idea of what their utility bills uh, will be. I think in a lot of cases we've seen um, tenants who are billed via rubs are given maybe a general description of what the rubs formula is like but uh, not the formula itself so that they can't do the math uh, and check the math for themselves. Um, fourth, disclosure of any additional fees or charges to tenants in connection with utility billing. Um, you know, uh, tenants will often see small uh, or maybe not so small administrative fees, uh, fees associated with the, perhaps the third party billers uh, costs in generating the bills for the tenant. Um, and those should certainly be disclosed ahead of time. And then finally, how the landlord will allocate any common area utility costs to the tenant, if any. Um, common area utility costs are often a, um, a, a surprise for tenants in our experience. So lastly, I'll just highlight uh, for your awareness, a tenant utility billing measure currently under consideration by the DC Council. Uh, this is Bill 25675, the Water is Life Amendment Act of 2024. This was introduced by council member Zach Parker. So uh, the two main pieces of this bill would be to um, remove DC Water's authorization to shut off water service in a residential property for non-payment of the bill, uh, except where the water service is causing waste, abuse of the water supply, or a danger to public health or safety. Uh, and you know this kind of addresses that um, that provision I highlighted earlier, where the um, 
the tenant may want to get on the water bill uh, in place of the landlord because the landlord hasn't been paying it and the water is going to be shut off and that's going to leave the tenant in a very bad position. Um, so here we would just, you know, cut that possibility off um, and keep the water service going. Uh, and then second, uh, tenant access to payment assistance programs. Uh, the measure would require DC Water to permit tenants to access payment plans and assistance programs that may help them to keep current on their water bills. Um, and with that, that concludes my presentation and I'll turn it back over to Joel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Joey. And thanks everybody for those excellent presentations. Um, I have questions uh, for each of the panelists, but we have 20 minutes left uh, for the Q&A period. I didn't want to interrupt uh, any of those important points being made. Nicole, do we have um, a questions, a bunch of questions maybe from the chat? We have a handful of questions from the chat. <laughs> okay, um, why don't we tackle those first? Sure, yeah. So uh, I've got one here. It says, my building is in the process of transitioning to a rubs format for common area utilities and individual water charges. I'm wondering how this will affect tenants who are voucher holders and rapid rehousing participants. Specifically, how will or won't this affect affordability assessment, market rate assessments, utility allowances, now that a large portion of tenants' responsibilities are no longer included in base rent and can vary drastically from month to month. Okay, was that directed towards anybody in particular or? No one in particular, just uh, just sort of general question to everybody. Okay, Can I, does anybody wanna tackle that question? I'm going to be very careful. I don't want to, obviously everyone's subsidy is very different from one another and, and it, it, everything can be very, very tricky. I do think that at least as far as the, those that are subsidy holders, um, every subsidy comes with rights and disclosures that are made at the beginning of the contract. The landlord generally must sign on with an agreement called a HAP, a housing assistance um, uh, payment agreement uh, that sets out disclosures to the tenant of what their obligations are. If those obligations are changing um, as a result of these changes in the building, I think that that raises some, some issues that the tenant may need to exercise or speak with their housing specialist or maybe with a, a landlord tenant lawyer. I'd suggest calling the um, um, the legal assistance network that I, I suggested, but I, I just, it, it can be very specific. So I don't, I, I it's just very hard to get into. Um, I, I think they're very good issues, very important issues, um, but I think that it's gonna, it would be very contextual about whatever the specific subsidy is and, and whatever the changes are that are happening are. Okay, that sounds like a great answer. Does, does anybody wanna add to that? Nicole, do you want to ask the next chat question? Yeah, so the next one is kind of along a similar vein, and it's generally, are there any special provisions that DC Housing Authority tenants have when it comes to how utilities are charged? That might be you again, Brian. Do you want to <laughs> um, again? Go again? I, I, that that I, I want again want to be careful just because even DC Housing Authority administers a number of different types of subsidies. There's public housing, there's vouchers, there's different types of vouchers. But again, I think that comes down to what that lease agreement says, what disclosures were made in the lease agreement, and what that HAP or housing assistance program um, has in it. So again, I would just encourage, and I'm not trying to to disrupt you know, to to not answer that question. I just think these are so individualized. That I think it's important that if you want to have that that issue reviewed, that you speak with an attorney. And and again, that legal assistance number um, 202-780-2575. Um, and we can have an attorney speak with you about those issues. Uh, Nicole, do you want to go yeah, ahead with I've, the next one? I've got a couple Thank more. You, so um, with the rubs method, is it also the case that tenants are at the mercy of other tenants who may not be as efficient with the energy, like setting the air conditioning to lower temperature, but keeping the windows open or the reverse? Well, I'll, I, I mean, I, I think uh, based on the descriptions um, from Emily, especially, but also from OTA's experience, uh, the answer is no. Uh, because uh, the apportionment happens um, without regard to non-payment from any tenants. So that the amount owed by each unit is uh, presumably, you know, if it's done 
a barrel rate would be equally apportioned among the units and a non-payment by one tenant would not impact uh, the payment that will become due for other tenants in the building. If I understood that question correctly. And Emily, do you want to weigh in on that? I, I understood the question to also be asking if, like, for example, my neighbor uses more water than I do, is my bill impacted? Or if I go on a month long vacation or I go to help family members for a month, will I have a lower bill um, than had I been on one? Um, and the answer is like, because the building is billed um, as a whole. It, your what your tenant does, right? And I think Joel alluded to this in his opening remarks, um, or perhaps Adam did as well. You could be the most environmentally conscious person, right? And you know, always turn the water off when you brush your teeth. But everyone else on your floor leaves it on. That will impact your bill under a rubs methodology because it is one master bill for the building that is then assessed to every tenant regardless of their individual use, based on the algorithm the building's using. Got it. Uh, totally agree. I think I misheard that part of that question. Um, I'm going to ask a question of Adam in that regard, because Adam, you spoke about sub-metering as a kind of solution uh, in a mixed-use building um, to, ensure, to help ensure that tenants don't get charged with uh, utility usage by commercial um, units within the building. And I wonder if um, that individual metering, um, by some metering, if you, if you would say individual metering would, would accomplish the job just as well uh, without raising the issues and the reasons why the Public Service Commission prohibited residential sub-metering in the first place. So uh, the term sub-metering is used differently in different contexts. Um, and I'm just wondering if uh, we were to substitute in our recommendations to the council, individuals um, metering uh, versus uh, sub-metering, would that accomplish the same purpose? Um, and is it practical? Are there other issues involved? How do you see that issue? I, I think it could. Um, some of the problem, though, at least as it pertains to water issues, which I'm more familiar with, uh, is that largely uh, DC water doesn't really have authority to do much beyond the meter box in the street. And so when you are looking at, say, a mixed use building, I have an example in my head of a client who came to us uh, who lived, who had a restaurant on the ground floor and then 40 condos up top. And they all paid the commercial rate, which is significantly higher than the residential rate. Uh, and so they were trying to figure out how they could get a meter in for just the condo units. And it was difficult because DC Water said that uh, essentially they could not install a meter because of the, the plumbing system, the way that it went into the building uh, and then distributed between uh, the commercial property and the condos above. And so I think it's more of a technical issue in terms of what the utility is responsible for that is, I think, um, I'd say a, a policy one, uh, because at least with, uh, at least with water, uh, it would become a significant plumbing issue uh, to install, uh, uh, you know, after the, beyond the street meter, individual meter within the property to subdivide a mixed use property. Um, but I think, to get to your question, Joel, as to whether or not um, individual meters could be doable, I, I it would be a cautious yes, it would, but it would be largely a case by case basis. Um, so okay. meters, you know, would have to be beyond that individual meter at the at the street level, and that's largely just a, a product of the the legal rights and responsibilities that the utility has. Okay, so if, if by so so sub metering uh, individual meters pose more problems in the water context than sub meters, is that a true statement? Or in terms of in terms of a, a legal kind of the utility installing them in the property, yeah, that would be a much more I'd say burdensome and uh, legally fraught approach. Okay, got it. Well, more to talk about there. 
Um, Nicole, do you um, do you have more questions from the chat? Yeah, just two more. Um, All right. So one of them is, why is there a difference between how utility charges are charged on rent-controlled properties versus non-rent-controlled properties? Well, I can, so uh, uh, either I or jo Joey, do you want to handle that one? Or do you want me to? Uh, I think I'll throw that one to you. Okay. So if I understand the, the question, it's how are utilities... Uh, uh, how do utilities charge work in rent control properties versus non rent control? Is that correct? Yes, that's Nicole? right. Okay, so um, it, in terms of whether the building um, can be master metered or individually metered for gas and electricity, it works the same. Uh, the difference, and that is to say that um, a building can be master meter, whether it's rent controlled or not. Uh, the landlord can get one giant bill from the gas or electric utility and probably use a rub system to apportion um, that large bill to the individual units. Uh, the same issues in terms of, um, you know, perhaps as Emily was explaining, um, the concepts in the um, Consumer Protection and Procedures Act would apply, but there aren't very particular uh, rules in place governing uh, how utility charges get, uh, get made and how the bill billing process works. So um, there are limitations there, but um, both uh, rent control and non-rent control buildings uh, can be moved from master meter to individual meter, and some in both categories are each uh, master and um, individually metered, and that's lawful. Um, the difference, as Joey was explaining, is that when a, a building is registered as under rent control, uh, the owner has to explain to the rent administrator's office what charges um, and what uh, services and what facilities are included in the rent. So that if a rent control building owner wants to move from master metering to sub metering, not sub metering, uh, Freudian slip, sorry, individual medium, uh, metering, they have to file a petition called the Reduction in Services and Facilities Petition, the point of which is to reduce the rent for those rent controlled units uh, to account for the fact that the rent is no longer going to include the amount of utility. And that amount is going to be shifted onto the tenants uh, who will then have a direct, and here's where I'm going to ask for confirmation from Adam. If it's lawful, it will be individually metered, meaning those tenants will have a direct relationship with the gas or the electric utility, and they will be billed specifically. They'll have their own accounts, and they're not going through the landlord. Um, it's, it's an expensive proposition for the tenants, but at least the rent is being reduced if it's being done right by that owner. Um, Adam, anything you wanna say there about the um, the um, individual metering part of that answer, especially? I think you covered it. Okay, thanks. Nicole, was that the last one? I think we have time for probably two or three more questions. I've got one more question. Um, okay. So somebody says, my building is currently uh, operating under the rubs format with water and sewer, and it's a very unfair to people like me who are a one-person household and we travel a lot, so we're not at home all the time. Um, we had a discrepancy with our utility bill a few months ago due to a leak in the building. We were charged hundreds in water and sewer. It was eventually resolved, but the following month and after that so on, our bills have gotten higher than previous months. So is there any way to enforce this, you know, to get the landlord to be more transparent with how the water and, and sewer usage is happening? Uh, I can see pretty much anybody answering that question. Does anybody want to? I, I can jump in a little bit. I, I think that's part of the issue that we've experienced is that there isn't an appeal process in the same way that uh, you would get if you were an individual homeowner. So if this was, you were know, an individual homeowner, you had a row home, you know, somewhere in the city uh, that was individually metered, 
you know, as I mentioned, you go to the Public Service Commission if it's a water or gas issue and you can appeal that, uh, you know, particular uh, dispute with uh, usage. Same thing with DC water. Uh, as a tenant, it is a much more difficult process that, uh, you know, is outside of OPC's boundaries. And I think, Emily, it sounded like the mediation process at OAG might be a, a more actionable route. Sure, thanks, Adam. Yep, um, I'd encourage you to file and submit a complaint to OAG mediation. And the approach that we take in these matters is to get a better understanding of the issue and the goal and that fight that there was a leak um, and then there was a reduction. Um, you know, starting with some of those maintenance or technical issues that I talked about, making sure that the leak has been fully fixed and that the end, the monitoring equipment wasn't affected. Um, to maybe it's being inflated bills. Um, if at the end of that, um, you know, your bill is correct, you know, the CPPA does provide a private right of action. You as an individual consumer, right, depending on the facts of your case, could bring a case into the CPPA based on the initial disclosure you received about the rights issue, if there was some sort of misrepresentation, Initial and ambiguity, but it is unfair. Um, but this is a really fact specific analysis that is open to interpretation and probably will involve some sort of a technical expertise as well, especially if the leak, uh, the leak is pulled into this. And that's why having more specific um, tenant uh, disclosures in the ROBS context and also very specific remedies for tenants in the drugs context, like you do in other aspects of our tenant laws, um, would be very helpful here. If I can, right. if I can add beyond that, even um, yes. I, I appreciate the need for disclosures. I'm going to push a little further because I would, I would note, I don't know if this is the same building that I'm thinking of, but we've seen uh, at least I can think of at least one building where we've seen multiple tenants come with that very issue to us, where there were leaks inside the building, utility bills jumped unexpectedly. And tenants received notices of eviction, you know, based on those increased bills that they were refusing to pay or didn't believe they needed to pay and proceeded toward eviction court um, and uh, over a consumer debt that they were disputing. And we have protections in the laws. If this was a credit card dispute, somebody steals your credit card and, and you don't think you owe that money, you have protections to challenge that debt. If somebody, you know, you know, but in this case, you know, you know, it, it, somebody had run up the water bill or there'd been a leak in the building, these folks were losing at risk of losing their homes. And so I, I would add beyond disclosures, I believe that there should be, I, I don't believe that the failure to pay a consumer debt should be the reason someone loses their home. Um, I think that we have protections, we have processes to collect debts that, that allowing a landlord to say that they are going to enter into the world of collecting debt um, over over and, and becoming a biller means that they should then be collecting those bills the same way any other consumer debt holder would collect those bills. And we should separate that out and directly make clear that no one should be evicted over the failure to pay a utility bill or any other consumer bill. Absent that, I would say that we should try to at least make those judgments redeemable, judgments that a tenant has the right to catch up on, and that any your to pay bill that puts someone at risk of losing their housing is cured by simply being required to pay the next month's bill, not a large back amount, which could then be disputed more properly through a collections action. Okay, Brian, thank you very much. And I am dying to ask about five questions of each of the panelists. I don't think I'm going to have that opportunity. Uh, to Amaker Brothers, do you want to cut us off about now? I think we have to close it out. So uh, let me just say that there were so many great issues presented and scenarios that tenants are really suffering from that need to be addressed. I was going to ask about priorities um, of the panelists, but um, instead, I'll just say thank you to each of the panelists for doing a great job for us. Uh, we want to stay in touch with all of you and with our stakeholders who are listening in about developing as we develop our our proposed solution uh in consultation with council and other uh, sister agencies and um uh the panelists and, and with stakeholders um nicole is there anything else that we need to address or should we just say good night 
Uh, I believe that's it. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending, and uh, have a great night.